Okay, we've been talking about the old brain and the new brain. Um, the old brain is uh, where all your emotions take place. It's, uh, it, it, it includes the brain stem, the cerebellum, the midbrain, and the limbic system. It's right in the middle of, of your brain. Sometimes it's referred to as the reptilian brain. Uh, the new brain uh, is the part that uh, allows you to think. Uh, it's the part that allows you uh, to reason. Uh, and that's the difference between the two. Uh, when we start talking about psychoactive substances, one of the things we're going to talk about is the fact that the, old, that, uh, the uh, psychoactive substances uh, operate on the old brain, not on the new brain. And sometimes, of course, they affect the new brain. Uh, they change the way that we think. They change the way the, they change what's happening. Uh, but uh, most of the effects uh, take place, uh, especially in the limbic system and the amygdala. Uh, the old brain uh, regulates your physiological uh, functions, your respiration, heartbeat, uh, body temperature, hormone release, uh, and movement. Uh, respiration, heartbeat, and body temperature is all controlled in the brain stem. Uh, hormone release is, has to do with the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And then, of course, movement is the cere cerebellum, this area right here. Uh, that's yellow in the picture. The old brain or the limbic system is the area that acknowledges the experience of basic emotions and cravings, and we've talked about that before. This is uh, where your emotions come from, uh, fear, anger, hunger, thirst, lust, pain, pleasure, all of this comes from uh, the limbic system. And uh, of course this is what's being affected uh, when we take uh, psychoactive substances. Uh, the old brain is the area that imprints survival memories, uh, specifically the, the limbic system. It tells us uh, you, you were shot at by, a, by somebody, you need to duck. Uh, if you hear a bullet whizzing over your head, you need to duck. That's a, a survival thing. If you hear a bear growling, of course, you need to uh, try to go the opposite direction that, that uh, they are going. You certainly don't want to run into a bear. Uh, most psychoactive substances act on the old brain, causing euphoria in this area, and thus, they, and thus providing the euphoric memories that lead to addiction. The emotions of the old uh, brain overpower the reasoning capacity of the cerebell, uh, cerebrum and lead to the repeated taking of euphoric substances. And that, of course, is the, is the old brain. That's the limbic system. Uh, you are, the psychoactive substances are giving you... Uh, uh, a feeling of euphoria, and then since you have that euphoria, you want to repeat that feeling uh, uh, again. Uh, of course, the euphoria is, uh, is a survival mechanism. Uh, it tells you when something is good so that you want to repeat it again. Uh, eating that, um, that candy bar gave you a uh, sugar rush, and so you want to do it again. Uh, and, and of course, if we, if we start taking psychoactive substances, we get a euphoric effect. And despite the fact that uh, it is anti-survival, uh, then potentially what will happen is that you will uh, you'll want to take it again because uh, you've got your survival instincts mixed up with your uh, euphoric instincts. As hominids advanced over time, more and more brain power was needed to survive. Uh, this came to us in the form of the cerebrum and the highly convoluted neocortex. Uh, as, uh, as creatures, we are not uh, very powerful. Uh, we don't have claws. We, our teeth are, are really not made for killing or for biting. Um, so in order for us to survive in an, a, a, a chaotic and a dangerous environment, uh, we needed to become smarter and smarter. <clears throat> Uh, when we were being hunted by leopards or by bears or whatever, uh, was looking for a little bit of meat, uh, we needed to know if you hear this thing in the underbrush, then you need to climb a tree and get away from it. Uh, that, was, that was us thinking. That was us uh, uh, trying to survive. Uh, we were coming up with ways to, uh, to survive. And of course now uh, we can uh, create a weapon that can uh, blow the uh, leopard away or blow the, uh, uh, to, to blow the, uh, the bear away. Uh, and that has to do with survival as well. Uh, so weapons, you know, spears, arrows, uh, bows, uh, clubs, rocks, uh, guns, knives, all of these things uh, we thought of and that other creatures don't actually use um, we thought of them because we are that we're kind of wimpy 
and uh, we needed uh, to uh, protect ourselves. We needed to survive. Uh, so it's the larger our cerebrum came, became, uh, the more likely we were to survive. The individuals that were smarter were the ones that, that were more likely to survive. Uh, and that is why the, our cerebrum looks like the, our cerebrum does and is as large as our cerebrum is. Most of the time, the new brain controls the old brain. Reasoning usually trumps emotion. Uh, however, when a person uses psychoactive substances, the craving from the old brain may override rational arguments. Uh, then the rational arguments are, are very real. Uh, drugs are expensive. They're, maybe they're too expensive for you to buy, especially if you're poor. Uh, there are bad side effects to them. Uh, if you're taking heroin, potentially you're going to uh, overdose. Potentially you might overdose. So the side effects are fairly severe. Uh, you're out of commission for a number of hours. Uh, you cannot function for a number of hours. Uh, if you smoke pot, the side effects are that your short-term memory is, is crap. Uh, and it stays that way for an extended length of time. Did you need something? Yeah. Sorry. You need something? No. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Got interrupted there for a minute. They're dangerous, of course. Uh, you may die from uh, take uh, from a heroin overdose. You have other responsibilities. Uh, and they're, they may be, hopefully they're more important than your pleasure. Uh, once upon a time I was a single parent. I had friends that told me the way that you get over a, a divorce or a, or a relationship. Is it, what time is it? It starts at 10.30? She's down in the, uh, on the third floor. So there, you have a class in here at 10.30? Okay. It's on the second floor. Uh, it's, it's right beside my office. You know where my oh, office is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting lecture. People keep coming to the door. Uh, the reward reinforcement pathway encourages a human to perform or repeat an action that promotes survival. It is this pathway that is affected by psychoactive substances. <clears throat> also referred to as a mesolimbic uh, dopaminergic reward pathway, That's, there's a name for you. It has a stop switch uh, and it has a more switch. The stop switch is in the orbitofrontal cortex, that is your reasoning uh, section of your brain. Uh, telling you, stop. <laughs> You've had enough or don't do it. Uh, this is stupid. Oh, I was telling you the story about uh, when I was a single parent. So when I was a single parent, um, uh, I had two kids and uh, my friends were telling me, hey, your wife has left you. Uh, the best way to get over that is to get drunk. Uh, so of course, um, my kids were staying with somebody else uh, and my friends took me out uh, to get drunk. And uh, I didn't take very much because I'm, I don't drink at all. Uh, anyway, I drank and then I realized that at some point I realized, my goodness gracious, I can't do this. This is stupid. Uh, I need to be there for my children. Uh, and, uh, and, and I stopped. I stopped drinking. I stopped drinking, let's see, my wife left in 75. Uh, the last drink I had was in 1976. Uh, so it took a little bit of time for me to realize, geez, what's going on? Um, I didn't drink hardly at all, only when my friends told me this is the only way to do it. My friends were idiots, and they were wrong. Uh, what I needed to do was take care of my kids. I needed to be responsible and take care of my kids. So my orbital frontal cortex actually switched, uh, switched it to stop. I'm not going to do this anymore. This is stupid. Uh, and I don't like to be stupid, so I stopped. <laughs> and I didn't drink anymore. Uh, the Moore uh, area is also known as the pleasure center and encompasses four structures and we will go over these over and over and over again. Uh, it starts out with the amygdala, that is your emotional uh, portion of your, of your brain, uh, the, literal, the lateral hypothalamus, the nucleus accumbens septi, and the ventral tegmental area. One feeds into the other and we, we get this uh, pleasure loop going on, this dopamine loop. 
and I'll talk about the dopamine loop. And what I'm talking about is the fact that it starts here, it starts in the amygdala, goes to the lateral hypothalamus, goes to the, nu the nucleus accumbens septi, and then it ends up in the ventral tegmental area. And that uh, will um, uh, uh, excite the amygdala once again, and then we go through the whole thing again. And that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, when you start taking something that makes you euphoric, uh, that you, you can't stop. It's difficult to stop because you're having this euphoric effect. You want the euphoric effect to continue, uh, so you continue to use, and of course we get this dopamine loop, this, this, uh, uh, this interesting loop taking place in our brains over and over again. The pleasure center uh, serves two purposes. It gives a feeling of satisfaction when a need is fulfilled or even the anticipation that a need will be fulfilled. And of course, uh, we don't have to do anything. We just have to anticipate that this might potentially happen uh, for us to feel good, uh, for us to feel satisfied. Uh, you passing this class, you know, once you pass this class, you're going to get a feeling of satisfaction uh, from, the, uh, from passing the class. It's not an easy class. There's a lot of strange things that we're going to talk about, and we're not going to say anything positive about drugs or, or alcohol. But it's just the anticipation of finishing. Uh, that may be what keeps you going uh, the third week, the fifth week, the seventh week, the ninth week, uh, finishing your paper and whatnot. Uh, it also gives a surge of relief or intense satisfaction when the pain is diminished. Uh, this is a painful process. I mean, edu education is relatively painful, and it can be painful. So one of the things that uh, will happen to you is that, uh, <laughs> uh, is that uh, about the seventh or eighth week, you'll be going, oh my God, I, can, I can't listen to Bradway yet. anymore. He just drives me crazy. I hate his voice. Uh, his jokes are stupid. Uh, this is a painful process, and I have to write that paper. What am I going to write my paper on? It's his fault, you know, that kind of thing. It's painful, uh, but the, the, uh, it will give you a surge of relief just thinking, you know, all I have to do is write this paper, do these discussions. You know, in, in your case, it's article critiques. I have to do these article critiques, uh, and uh, then I'm finished. You know, all I have to do is is uh, suffer through his lectures. That's all I have to do. But once it's over with, I don't have to ever take Bradway again. Oh man, he's such a pain. <clears throat> Psychoactive substances activate the pleasure circuit and rewards the individual with a feeling of satisfaction or pain relief. Uh, unfortunately, psychoactive substances overactive, uh, at, well, I'm sorry, they overactivate the pleasure center and shut down the stop switch, enabling the individual to feel an intense need to continue its use. So the problem is that your uh, orbital frontal uh, cortex uh, becomes, over, uh, becomes overridden. Uh, the, um, uh, it overact the substance overactivates your pleasure center, and because of that, uh, the stop switch gets uh, run over, just like what has happened here. I can't stop. And of course, if you've ever talked to anybody who was addicted to any substances, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, or crystal meth, uh, they, they'll tell you that they can't stop. It's not their fault. It's somebody else's fault. Or it's nobody else's fault. It's the drug's fault. That's what it is. Let's blame the drug. Uh, three phases of brain activity with reward reinforcement pathway. The anticipation of drug use or compulsive behavior creates craving. So you don't even have to use it. All you have to do is anticipate that it's going to happen. Uh, all, you, all you have to do is uh, decide, gee, I think I'll go over to Jimmy's house. Uh, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy has a uh, pot, and so I'll go over there. And uh, all of a sudden, your brain starts, it, all of this pleasure center it gets activated, and you're, now you have a craving for smoking pot uh, because you're going over to Jimmy's house. And the closer you get to Jimmy's house, uh, the... Uh, uh, stronger that it gets. It's kind of like uh, if you fall in, if you're in love with somebody uh, and you're get, going to get closer to them, uh, you know, you get this, this desire to be with them uh, and it's the same thing. It's the, the pleasure principle works with love as well as psychoactive substances. Uh, internal or external cues will activate the amygdala, which causes a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which in turn activates the nucleus accumbens, causing the craving. So we get this, the, the pleasure center, the, the whole cycle starts once again. And it starts, and the, the closer you get, whether it's an external cue or an internal cue, when you see somebody that you're, you're in love with, of course, you get this 
uh, pleasurable feeling. Uh, you get the uh, feeling of, uh, of, of desire uh, to be with them, of course, and that's an external cue. Uh, but even before you get there, even before you arrive at their house, the internal cues, you're thinking about them, and because you're thinking about them, of course, that gives you the craving uh, to be with them. For an alcoholic passing a bar, which is an external cue, uh, this would activate the amygdala, causing a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which would activate the nucleus accumbens, causing a craving for alcohol. All you have to do is go past it. All you have to do is go past the bar. Uh, you go past the bar, you uh, uh, potentially you can't even smell the alcohol, but just thinking about drinking alcohol in the bar, where you always do your drinking, uh, strangely enough, you can almost taste it and probably you're thinking about what this stuff tastes like. Uh, so that's a possibility as well. Uh, if there is an external, that, so that would be an external cue. Uh, for someone who smoked pot with their friends before they went away to school, when they see their friends on spring break, despite the fact that they haven't smoked any pot uh, while they were in school, uh, this is an external cue when they, you see your, your, your pothead friends it will activate your amygdala, causing a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which would activate the nucleus accumbens, causing a craving for pot. Uh, so all of a sudden, just because you see these individuals, these individuals that you smoke pot with, now you have a craving for pot. This is a lifestyle. You have uh, in, in, ingrained yourself into this lifestyle. So all you have to do is be with the person that you do these things with, and all of a sudden you get a craving. The second phase of the reward reinforcement pathway involves the brain telling the individual to do it again after ingesting the psychoactive substance. <clears throat> Remember, we've got the, our, our orbital frontal cortex is trying to tell us uh, to do things in moderation, uh, that we need to be responsible, uh, don't do it again. It, it says stop, but of course the reward reinforcement pathway is telling you do it again. Uh, with use, uh, dopamine is released from the ventral tegmental area, which activates the nucleus accumbens to continue the craving. So uh, now we have short-circuited. We don't need the emotions anymore. Uh, now that the, uh, the uh, dopamine from the ventral tegmental area is activating the nucleus accumbens, and we, we still have the craving. Phase three of the reward reinforcement pathway involves a nucleus accumbens signaling the orbitofrontal cortex that it has taken in the substance and asks for a single signal of more or satiation. So now we're asking our brains, we're asking our, the reasoning portion of our brain, whether we should uh, smoke, whether we should do it again, or whether we, are, we have had enough. Uh, in addicts and abusers, this signal is weakened as the reasoning function of the area resulting in ingestion does not lead to satiation. Uh, so if you're an addict or if you're an abuser, uh, you can't stop. And uh, the, that portion of your brain uh, has rationalized or it's done something, uh, but the reasoning portion of your brain is not telling you to stop, even though that would probably be the best thing for you to do is to stop. So if you're an addict, of course, you can't stop. If you're an abuser, uh, maybe you can stop, but you don't want to stop. Why would, in the world would you stop when there's more pot to be smoked? smoked? Psychoactive substances imprint the memory of euphoria or pain relief more deeply than most natural survival memories. The alteration of brain chemistry causes normal activities to be less pleasurable. To a methamphetamine uh, addict, the desire for the drug will be more important than her relationship with her children. Uh, as we know from uh, talking to uh, Kevin Cody, um, who used to work security here, uh, he lives in Pinyon. He has been in law enforcement in Pinyon for an extended length of time. Uh, he was saying that one of the problems that they ran into in Pinyon was that uh, that. Uh, women were selling their um, children. They were literally selling them for a fix. Uh, they were giving them away, well not give, really giving them away, but they were selling them. People were giving them money and then they were, they were using their children or they were, they were taking their children. Uh, but the love of the, the, this feeling of euphoria that they got was stronger than their love for their own children, which seems to be uh, fairly extreme if you think about it. Uh, to the compulsive gambler, gambling will become more important to them than food or sex. 
Uh, if you honey, if you're a, a compulsive gambler and you honeymoon in Ve Vegas, one of the things that will happen is that you will spend a lot more time uh, gambling on the floor than you will up in your room having a uh, honeymoon, being on, on your honeymoon. Uh, psychoactive substances tend to affect the physiological uh, functioning of the body, especially heart rate and respiration. It is the uh, effect on respiration that causes most drug overdose emergencies and death because it has uh, slowed down your respiration, <clears throat> it has slowed down your heart rate, uh, especially if you're on opiates or opioids, uh, you can overdose. And if you overdose, of course, those areas can be arrested. You can have a heart attack, uh, you can stop breathing, and the only thing that you can do is inject the individual with something that will block the opiate or o opioid uh, from functioning, and that substance is Narcan. Uh, it is a uh, chemical that uh, um, stops the, uh, the process. The, uh, it, it actually stops any process, so it doesn't just work on opiates and opioids. You can also use it with cocaine, you can use it with uh, just about any drug because it will block uh, that uh, substance from uh, inhabiting the neurotransmitter uh, receptor sites that, uh, that it does. Psychedelics, LSD, marijuana, and the rave drugs not only affect the old brain, but it affects the new brain as well. <clears throat> not only makes you feel euphoric, but it also does not something to your thinking process. These drugs especially affect memory as they activate uh, two areas of the brain that help to control memories, the amygdala and the hippocampus. And because they affect these two areas, the amygdala, which has to do with emotion, and the hippocampus, which has to do with memory, uh, because they affect both of them, <clears throat> both areas, uh, the individual's short-term memory uh, is affected. Uh, so if you have LSD, uh, you remember your trip, the trip that you were on, but of course it affects your short-term memory for, for a period of time so you can't really remember things very well after your trip. You can remember the trip but you can't remember anything else. Uh, marijuana of course also uh, affects the uh, short-term memory uh, and while you are smoking and high you can't remember from one moment to the next what's going on. Uh, and if, uh, Unfortunately uh, LSD doesn't really stay in your system very long but, uh, but uh, marijuana does, and it'll stay in your system for an extended length of time. So you're kind of, your memory is not, is not, as, is not 100%, and it won't be 100% for um, you know, two or three days, maybe a week. Uh, it'll stay in your system and affect you uh, for up to three to four weeks. As people age from childhood to adolescence to adulthood, they learn to integrate the drives of the old brain with the reasoning and common sense of the new brain. Developmental problems, childhood traumas such as chaotic or abusive childhoods, abusive behavior or psychoactive drug use can circumvent survival mechanisms and lead to irrational behavior or addiction. Uh, so one of the problems with, uh, with uh, uh, not raising, your, raising a child very well, uh, abusing them, or uh, living in a chaotic, uh, 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 abusive uh, relationship or, or, or home life, uh, this will cause the individual later uh, to, not, uh, to not reason very well. And of course, th then they will, be, they will act out in order to get attention, or they will uh, start participating in addictive behaviors, whatever that is, whatever that may potentially be. Uh, the most important structure of the reward reinforcement uh, pathway is the nucleus accumbens septi. Uh, this bundle of nerves is the most powerful reinforcer in the pathway. Uh, they have done experiments with it uh, with rats. Uh, they have uh, stimulated, uh, they, they have implanted a, an electrode uh, in the rat's brain, uh, in the nucleus accumbens septi, and they've stimulated the brain, and they have allowed the, the rat to stimulate themselves, and the rat will not eat, they will not sleep, they just stimulate their uh, nucleus accumbens septi, and they will do this to the point of death. They will do it to the point of death. Human subjects who stimulated uh, the same area behaved in a similar manner to the rats. Of course, we didn't allow them to kill themselves or to die, to, to starve themselves to death by stimulating themselves. Social factors uh, tend to affect the uh, uh, obsession uh, to use a psychoactive substance. The psychoactive substance alters the brain chemistry to make the individual want to use. This is one reason why only complete abstinence will stop the craving. So you can't, 
Uh, once you go, go cold turkey and you stop using, it's not like you can have a, uh, if you're an alcoholic, it's not like you can uh, oh, just have a social drink. Uh, well, I'm just a, uh, drinking a martini uh, at lunch or whatever. You can't do that. Uh, if you're an alcoholic, you have to stop. You don't have a choice. Uh, because that connection has been made and once you start again, once you start, it'll go right back to the same intense level that it was before. Uh, this happened to Robin Williams. Robin Williams <clears throat> uh, was a co cocaine addict uh, when he was younger, when he was Mork, uh, on Mork and Mindy. Uh, he used a lot of cocaine and he was an addict. He, he uh, cleaned himself up and he stopped uh, using as much cocaine. Uh, and he was on the wagon for a, for a long time. Uh, while he was uh, off cocaine, uh, his acting became better. Uh, he was not as erratic uh, in, his, uh, in his behavior pattern. Uh, so uh, uh, he, was, and he, was, he was relatively successful as an actor. And people liked him because he was, he was genuinely funny. Uh, he had some really interesting ideas. Um, at the, uh, at the beginning of his comedy routines when he was younger and using cocaine, uh, his delivery was, was machine gun style. Uh, boom, 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 boom. I mean, it's, it was one joke right after the other, and people just thought that that was hilarious. Uh, afterwards, of course, it was more cerebral. The, his comedy was more cerebral. Uh, it wasn't the same uh, delivery system. Um, just before he died, he went off the wagon. He used cocaine again for one reason or another. And, uh, and he went back into rehab because he knew that, uh, that he, didn't have a sh he didn't have a chance if he didn't uh, go back into rehab. Uh, just after he came out, of, uh, while he was in rehab, he learned that he had rapid onset Alzheimer's disease. And uh, after he came out of rehab, uh, it wasn't more than a couple weeks later that he uh, committed suicide. We can only assume that the suicide had to do with more to do with the rapid onset Alzheimer's disease rather than the uh, cocaine addiction. That he was, it was still a monkey that was on his back that he couldn't get rid of. Brain imaging has shown that brain cells uh, change as, as addiction develops. Uh, while normal memory uh, t doesn't take place until an action has been repeated three or more times, intense stimulation can cause sensitization with just one encounter. And of course that is one of the reasons why they tell you that you can all, that you can never even try crystal meth one time. You try it one time, you're addicted, uh, and that's because it has changed uh, the, the it has sensitized your brain uh, to, to uh, crave uh, that substance again. These neural pathways are highly sensitive and have uh, and may cause relapse in just one additional encounter, and that's one of the reasons why you can never go back again. You can never oh I think I'll just use it this one time. I'll just take this one drink. I'll just drink this one bottle of vodka. Uh, why do psychoactive drugs disrupt the on and off switches of the reward reinforcement pathway? One theory is that since uh, they don't originate from the essential body needs, from an essential body needs, the brain has no satiation point established for psychoactive substances. It doesn't know when to stop. Uh, there is no we don't naturally drink a lot of alcohol. This isn't a natural thing. We have to, we have to pick it up. Uh, and since we, we, it, we, it's not a natural substance like sugar or fat or, or, or vitamins or whatever, we have no natural satiation point. So we don't know when to stop. Another theory, a second theory is uh, uh, the person doesn't realize that the act has been completed. Uh, the person will use until they run out of the drug or they pass out. And of course, if we've ever been to a party, uh, I hardly ever go to parties, but if you go to a party, a lot of times you'll watch somebody drink until either somebody cuts them off or they pass out. Uh, they just don't know when to quit. And of course, that's what has happened to this individual. Uh, this is a bottle of Smirnoff's. I think that's beer that he's got, laying cans of beer. Anyway, he's passed out. He's gone. <clears throat> so you don't know when to stop, <clears throat> unfortunately. A third theory is that the psychoactive drug creates such euphoria, euphoria or pain relief that the on and off switch is ignored or overridden by the brain. 
<clears throat> you're having such a good time that your brain goes, what harm will it do? And of course you just keep going and then, then you find out what kind of harm it really does do. A fourth theory is that the psychoactive substance disrupts communication between the old and the new brains. Uh, many psychoactive substances incapacitate the thinking and reasoning portion of the new brain, and the individual reverts to old brain instincts or automatic functioning. And of course, that's what the, how the old brain functions. It functions by, uh, it just uh, flips it on automatic, and everything is just comp continually repeated. Uh, and you just can't stop. Your arm just keeps moving towards your mouth with that glass of, uh, of vodka or whatever, tequila. Those shots, you have to take those shots. You're trying to impress your friends, and I have no idea how he did that. None whatsoever. My goodness gracious. <laughs> As a kid, I used to do something like that, but not since I've grown up at all. <clears throat> the main instrument of the nervous system is the neuron. We talk about this all the time. We talk about this in most of our classes. I get to talk about this in social psychology. I get to talk about it in uh, substance abuse and health psychology. Uh, what's the other class I'm teaching? Whatever the other class I'm teaching. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> I, get to, I get to tell you exactly the same thing. Uh, poor Edison, of course, is in every one of my classes, so he gets to hear this over and over and over again. The neuron is composed of, of three structures, the soma, the axon, and the dendrites, the soma, the axon, and the dendrites. Information comes into the neuron through the dendrites and is distributed to other entities through the terminals at the end of the axon. Why is this important? Why are we going to talk about neurons? We're going to talk about neurons because when we talk about psychoactive substances, they act on select neurons. Uh, they act on a certain portion of the, the neuron. Normally, they act on the uh, axon terminal, uh, the area that uh, releases the neurotransmitter. Each neuron can contact with uh, one entity up to 150,000 entities. It is estimated that there is between 100, tri 100 trillion to 500 trillion neuronal connections in the human body. That's a, lot of th that's a lot of connections to count, and nobody has actually done it. Not only that, but, uh, well, we can see there's a huge difference between 100 trillion and 500 trillion. The more things that you've done, the more things that you've seen, the more things that you've experienced, the more connections that you're going to have. Uh, so if you have somebody that just sits in their chair all day long and watches, I don't know, Jeopardy on television, um, then probably they don't have a whole lot of connections. They don't move, they don't see what's going on outside, they never listen to the news, so nothing changes. Uh, they watch old reruns of Matlock, uh, so there's not a whole lot going on. Their brains are, are not really developing. Uh, but somebody that uh, travels, somebody that uh, goes hiking, uh, somebody that uh, is, is a, a physician, uh, they're going to have trillions and trillions more uh, connections than the individual that's relatively sedentary. Neurons are different lengths from fractions of millimeters to the sciatic nerve, which runs from, it's, it's sometimes a meter long depending on how tall you are, it runs from the back of your heel uh, to your spinal column and it goes through your buttocks and so you have a sciatic nerve on each side of your, on, on, from each leg uh, and it runs through the middle of your buttocks, your sciatic nerve. Uh, it's relatively long depending on how tall you are of course. Uh, people with longer legs have longer sciatic nerves. Uh, as short as I am, my sciatic nerve isn't very, isn't very long. However, I have suffered from sciatica. Uh, my mother suffered from sciatica. Uh, the sciatica is usually caused by uh, a, a displacement of your sciatic nerve. It's got, gotten out of its sheath and it's moved over uh, and it's being irritated by uh, movement. It gets irritated by uh, uh, sitting down. It gets ir irritated by everything. Uh, so you have to uh, either reseed it, somehow you've got to reseed it, uh, or you take painkillers to get rid of the pain. In my case, uh, I reseeded it. I was able to get it back into its proper place. Uh, from time to time, uh, it, will sh it will shift out, and I have to reseed it again. How do you reseed a sciatic nerve? Well, I, I guess... Genetically, it's, it's easy for me, or it's easy, as, as I've discovered, I can, I can do it fairly uh, readily. Uh, what I do is I touch my knee to my chest, and if I can do that, that, uh, that tightens everything, that tightens all those muscles, uh, and it reseats it. Uh, so if you have sciatica, you might try that. Uh, it doesn't work on everybody, we're all different, 
Uh, we all have different structures. Uh, so potentially this works on uh, for me and maybe it won't, won't work for everybody. Uh, neurons uh, do not touch, but they do communicate with one another. Uh, this communication takes place in synaptic cleft, a gap between the two neurons, and of course this is what it looks like. In order for the two neurons to communicate, a chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter must uh, pass between them. The neurotransmitter is housed in tiny sacs called vesicles. These are the vesicles and these are, are uh, the uh, areas of the, uh, the uh, axon knob uh, that will release the, uh, the neurotransmitter when they are stimulated. Uh, now we're going to talk about some of the uh, neurotransmitters that we have discovered. The first neurotransmitter discovered was acetylcholine. It's a monoamine or a catecholamine. Uh, it activates your muscles. Uh, it also works as a vasodilator. In other words, it, it expands your blood vessels. It controls mental acuity, uh, memory, and learning, so it's very important. Uh, we know all of this because uh, individuals suffering from Alzheimer's disease are individuals whose uh, acetylcholine-producing cells in their brains uh, are dying. And if they die, of course, they don't have enough acetylcholine. If they don't have enough acetylcholine, uh, the first thing that goes is the memory, and then movement uh, goes away. Uh, and uh, eventually, of course, they will die from... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, from, from not remembering things, as odd as that sounds. What they, they usually, uh, it affects their uh, swallowing mechanism and they, uh, and they begin to choke without uh, being able to clear their airways and that's usually why they die. The second, uh, um, the second neurotransmitter that we discovered was uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine. Uh, when we first discovered it, we thought that it was, a, it was the same, it was the same uh, neurotransmitter just two ends of the same neurotransmitter. Uh, but as we discovered, uh, we could stimulate norepinephrine and uh, the individual uh, would have a select reaction. Are you teaching? I'm, I'm recording my lecture. Oh, I you need something? Um, the book for Yeah, it's downstairs in my office. What time do you uh, o'clock. Is that good enough? Or do you have class? I'll stay in that class today. Okay, I'll bring it to class. I, okay. I, I was going to remember it today. So. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so what happened was we uh, we were able to discover we were able to discover uh, norepinephrine because if we activated one end of this thing that we thought that we had, uh, it caused uh, the individual to feel confident and feelings of well-being. This is really kind of interesting because uh, we can take care of uh, depression. Uh, by increasing your norepinephrine level. Uh, epinephrine, of course, has to do with energy. It is, uh, uh, it is adrenaline or, or energy that, uh, that, or epinephrine uh, that is activated when uh, you're excited. Uh, when you need uh, strength, uh, epinephrine will be produced. Uh, norepinephrine will be pro produced at the same time. However, <clears throat> um, of course, the, it's the epinephrine that gives you the energy, and it's the norepinephrine that makes you feel confident and uh, good about what's going on. Uh, dopamine is uh, also a monoamine uh, or a catecholamine a neurotransmitter. It regulates fine motor muscular activity, emotional stability. It tells you when you're satiated uh, and it's part of the reward reinforcement pathway. It is, it is the neurotransmitter that uh, gives you your euphoria. So it's very, very important as far as the reward reinforcement pathway is concerned. Dopamine is the most important neurotransmitter involving, involved in drug use because of the reward reinforcement pathway. If it didn't make you feel good, if you weren't euphoric, uh, when you take a psychoactive substance, you wouldn't take it again because you wouldn't feel so good. <clears throat> Reduced dopamine leads to Parkinson's disease. Uh, Parkinson's disease has to do with, with movement. Uh, uh, individuals with Parkinson's disease uh, can't control their hands. Uh, they have hand tremors. Uh, they don't. They have a hard time walking, uh, and that's Parkinsonian symptoms. A lot of times, when you take, uh, if you take, um, uh, if you take, <laughs> if you take psychoactive substances, if you take too much uh, crystal meth uh, or methamphetamines or cocaine, if you snort too much cocaine, uh, you will get Parkinsonian symptoms. You'll have hand tremors, you'll have a jerky movement that you can't control. Uh, all of that has to do with, uh, with dopamine. 
Excess dopamine causes schizophrenia. Uh, this is a famous drawing uh, by a man suffering from schizophrenia. As you can see, the cat started out as a cat. Uh, it started getting a little bit more bizarre, and eventually, of course, it turned into some kind of a uh, fantastic monster. <clears throat> so, but, so excess dopamine causes schizophrenia. The reason we know this is because if we give you medication, if you have schizophrenia, we give you medication to block your dopamine receptor sites, uh, then you start acting normally. Uh, your schizophrenia will be dissipated to some extent. Um, histamine is another catecholamine. It controls inflammation of tissue and allergic reaction. It causes inflammation and uh, it uh, tells you when you're, you're having an allergic reaction. Uh, it regulates your emotion, uh, emotional behavior and sleep. Uh, so if you had, uh, <clears throat> if you had a cold or, or yeah, if you had a cold, uh, you might take an antihistamine and that will reduce the swelling and it will reduce the allergic reaction, Claritin and, and uh, uh, all of those, Zyrtec, I guess. I think Zyrtec, maybe, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, Claritin is, a, is an antihistamine. Uh, so if you take an antihistamine, <clears throat> it, changes, <clears throat> it changes the allergic reaction. It reduces the inflammation. And it makes you go to sleep, which is kind of curious. The antihistamine. Uh, another catecholamine, probably potentially the most, well, all of these are extremely important uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, serotonin uh, controls your mood and stability. Um, it, uh, if not enough serotonin leads to depression, it controls your appetite, it controls your sleep, uh, and it controls your sexual activity, as uh, interesting as that is. Uh, mood can be elevated by forcing more serotonin in, into the synaptic clefts. And of course, that's what we're doing with selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We're forcing more serotonin in the synaptic cleft and taking away your depression. Uh, how does it affect sexual activity? Uh, the, your sex drive is uh, created by testosterone in your hypothalamus. <clears throat> uh, testosterone, of course, um, uh, uncontrolled testosterone will give you a, an overactive sex drive um, and, and you will be inappropriate uh, frequently. Uh, so how in the world does the bo human body control uh, the, your sex drive? Uh, it controls it with serotonin. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter uh, with t testosterone. And so what it will do it, is it will curb the sex drive. Uh, so serotonin, that's what it does. It uh, controls your sex drive. Of course, if you take selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and your sex drive is relatively weak, uh, then potentially what will happen is that you will lose your sex drive. Uh, it will curb your, it will increase the serotonin level in your brain so much that, uh, it, that it will curb your, your testosterone uh, and your sex drive completely. <clears throat> Uh, there are three opioid peptides, uh, there are three uh, uh, pain relieving uh, uh, opioid peptides, uh, enkephalin, uh, endorphin, and dynorphins. Uh, and there, you know, we used to talk about endorphins and, and runner's high and whatnot. Uh, now we know that there are three of them. There are three different chem chemical structures uh, that, will, that will relieve your pain. Uh, as I've told you before, I'm not sensitive to opiates. Uh, one of the reasons may be that my uh, endorphin receptor sites, I, I don't have very many endorphin receptor sites. Does that mean that if I go out and, and uh, play football and get tackled, then I'm going to start crying because it hurts so much? Uh, probably not. And the reason is because even though I don't have very many endorphin receptor sites, I have enkephalin receptor sites and di dynorphin uh, receptor sites. <clears throat> so I... I you know, I'm as uh, insensitive to pain as, as just about anybody else. Uh, one of the things that these three things, uh, these three uh, neurotransmitters do is regulate pain, of course. It also relieves uh, uh, stress. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why when you're running, uh, if you have to run uh, five miles, then about two miles into the race, all of a sudden you get this surge of energy. Uh, the, uh, you're not worried anymore. You have a feeling of well-being. Uh, and that's because your, your runner's high has kicked in, your endorphins have kicked in. Uh, it also reduces your immune response. Uh, it reduces the digestion in your, in your stomach, and uh, it affects other physiological functions as well. Uh, what it's trying to do is trying to make you uh, focus on what you have to do. Uh, the, uh, you have to function.
Gamma immunobutyric acid is, uh, or GABA, is an amino acid. Uh, it's, main, it's the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. It's involved in 25 to 40% of all synapses in the brain. It controls your impulses. It controls your muscle relaxation. It controls your arousal. Uh, it actually slows down your brain. Uh, one of the things that it does is that if you don't have enough GABA, uh, then you feel anxious. Uh, so if we can increase your GABA, we can actually take your anxiety away. It's an anxiolytic. Uh, so, well, uh, Xanax is an anxiolytic, and what it does, it increases your GABA level. So you, you uh, and it takes away panic attacks. Uh, so that's one of the uh, functions of GABA. Alcohol uh, has a strong effect on GABA. Uh, a lot of people feel good. Um, you know, they were stressed. Uh, they were anxious before, then they got drunk, and now they feel pretty damn good. Uh, why is that? Well, it has increased the GABA level in your, in your uh, system. Now, this can be a problem uh, because if you do this too often, uh, one of the things that will happen is that the neurotransmitters, the uh, uh, receptor sites for GABA will downregulate. And if that happens, when you're not drunk, now you're, you're, you're getting a rebound effect and you're starting to feel more anxious. Uh, so what do you do? Well, well you, you need a drink. And so you go out and you get yourself a drink. And that makes you feel better because it increases your GABA level superficially. Uh, glycine is another amino acid. It is an, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's found in your brain stem and your spinal column. It slows down your brain. Glycine does. I, you would think that that wouldn't be good. But sometimes, uh, well, sometimes uh, you're, you're thinking too much. Uh, you know, you got bad news at work today and now you can't sleep that night. You know, you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and all, you do, all you're doing is, is thinking about this situation and how you're going to take care of it. Uh, it has to do with, pro it's, it's prominent in protein uh, synthesis as well, and that's glycine. Uh, another uh, amino acid is glutamic acid. Uh, it's important, it's, it's an important excitatory neurotransmitter. It plays a role in uh, cognition, in motor functioning, in sensory functioning. It reinforces your memory. Uh, it is actually a uh, precursor to GABA. Uh, and so it's very important to your brain. Uh, one of the tachykinins is substance P. Tachykinin uh, has to do with the uh, pain neurotransmitters. You, your brain needs to know when you're in pain because the, your brain needs to know to move your hand out from uh, that, the fire. Uh, or it needs to know to, for you to, to move your arm. Or for you to straighten your broken nose back up. Uh, you know, it, it's, so it's very important. It's very important. Pain is very important. It is a messenger. And it tells you to stop doing what you're doing, dummy. Uh, substance P, and P stands for peptide, uh, conveys a pain message to the brain from the peripheral nervous system. Enkephalins will block substance P, and that's why, uh, that's why uh, potentially if you hurt yourself, at the beginning it, you hurt so that you can move, but all of a sudden it doesn't hurt anymore. Well, why doesn't it hurt? Well, the enkephalins have, uh, have blocked the substance P from getting to your brain. So now at least you can escape. You know, you've broken your finger and ah, it hurts, and then it swells up and the pain goes away. Why does the pain go away? Well, the enkephalins have kicked in and it is blocking that substance P from getting to your brain. Now, of course, you can run away and don't have to worry about it. Uh, anandamide, uh, we didn't discover this stuff until in the 90, 1990s. Before that, we weren't exactly sure. You know, people were saying, well, marijuana, it's natural. It's got receptor sites in the brain. Nobody now understands what these receptor sites are doing. Well, eventually we figured out what those receptor sites were doing and why they were there. Uh, they were there, they are anandamide uh, receptor sites. Anandamide has an affinity for the receptor site that accommodates THC. In other words, whatever that receptor site is, THC will inhabit it as well as anandamide. Uh, so, in essence, it's an anandamide uh, receptor site that THC inhabits. Uh, it's found in the limbic system. If you've never smoked pot, then you only, you only have anandamide uh, receptor sites, and, you, and uh, you have never had them inhabited by anything other than anandamide. 
Uh, it's found in the limbic system, that is the, in the primitive brain, in the reptilian brain, in the old brain. Integration of sensory experiences, uh, it in integrates sensory experiences with emotion. Uh, so if you see a lovely sunset, uh, your, the sense, the, your sense is that this is the prettiest sunset I've ever seen, and of course uh, that makes you feel euphoric, and that has to do with anandamide. It controls learning, motor coordination, and memory. It acts as an analgesic, so it takes away pain. Uh, where's the food? Anyway, okay. So if you've ever been around somebody smoking pot, a lot of times they're getting just the biggest kick out of the back of their hand, man. It's just like the coolest thing in the world. So their eyesight, they're seeing the back of their hand, and they're becoming emotional about what their back of their hand looks like, as odd as that seems. How does it control uh, everything else? When you're smoking pot, you're not very functional. That's why you shouldn't drive. Uh, another thing that's happening is that uh, your short-term memory is crap. Uh, and the reason it's crap is because uh, anandamide uh, increases, <laughs> increases the, uh, your short-term memory and uh, it, the, the uh, anandamide receptor sites are being uh, inhabited by the THC. It also takes pain away, uh, which is something that marijuana will do. Uh, corticotropin is, comes from the pituitary gland. Uh, it uh, induces uh, the uh, ACTH. ACTH will, will go to the uh, adrenal glands and it will induce them to uh, produce uh, cortisone. Uh, cortisone it aids in, uh, immune system, in your immune system. Uh, it, helps your he it helps healing and it's part of the stress control uh, of your body. Uh, so if you are get excited, and that's why uh, corticotropin, if you're in danger uh, and you're all excited, uh, then your immune system actually becomes stronger. Uh, you will heal faster if you get injured and uh, you won't feel stress. Uh, and that is the job of cortisone. Uh, nitric oxide wasn't discovered until 1992. And in the beginning we're going, geez, what is this stuff? It's a gas. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, nitrous oxide is uh, laughing gas. Uh, but this is nitric oxide and it's in your system and it acts as a neurotransmitter. And in the beginning, of course, we had a difficult time figuring out what it was, go what it was doing. Uh, one of the, but then we discovered that it uh, is uh, necessary in erectile function. And of course, that has something to do with, uh, with uh, what's the, what are the drugs? Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis. We don't see those commercials on television anymore. I'm, I'm a little confused. I don't know why they've gone away. <clears throat> I guess they're selling so much they don't have to advertise. Uh, anyway, so it has to do with, uh, with erectile function. It helps regulate your emotions. Uh, in, in too large dosages, it can cause cancer and vascular collapse. Uh, you would think we could just pump this stuff into your system and uh, you wouldn't have to take Viagra and uh, you would... Uh, <laughs> you can control your emotions better, but of course you can't really do that uh, because if we give you too much, uh, then you uh, overdose or you die. Uh, okay, what psychoactive drugs uh, work on what uh, neurotransmitters? Alcohol directly affects your GABA level, as we said before. Uh, it also affects metaencephalin, metaencephalin and uh, serotonin. I think that's, that's there's supposed to be an A in there. Anyway, and serotonin. Uh, okay, so when you drink alcohol, it makes you happy uh, and uh, takes away your anxiety uh, takes, and takes away your stress because GAB takes away stress as well. Uh, makes you happy and takes away your stress. Uh, so if you are, if you drink every day, uh, well, you don't have to worry about your stress and you don't have to worry about happiness. Uh, but what happens on that day you don't drink? Uh, if you were drinking, to take away the anxiety and to take away or to give yourself happiness, uh, what happens when you're not drinking? Well, you get the rebound effect. And now all of a sudden, you're more unhappy than, than you would have been, and uh, the stress is greater. Uh, so what does that do? Well, that induces you to drink again. Uh, so this is the, the, the vicious cycle that you have to go through. <clears throat> Uh, if you if you drink too much alcohol, now you can't you can't be happy and you you have too much stress unless you're drunk unless you're drinking. Benzodiazepines uh, benzodiazepines are are uh, uh, depressants. 
Uh, they directly affect your GABA level and your glycine. Uh, they, uh, so what do they do? They put you to sleep. Uh, and of course they affect the GABA and the glycine level. Marijuana uh, affects your anandamide, your arachidonyl glycerol, your acetylcholine, and your dynorphin. Dynorphin, it, it, it stimulates your dynorphin, and that's why it's an analgesic, takes the pain away. Uh, it stimulates your acetylcholine, um, and it, of course it uh, stimulates your anandamide as well. Uh, one of the reasons that you get the munchies after you've been smoking pot is because it, it stimulates your, your uh, anandamide has to do with satiation. Uh, and since the anandamide isn't there, the THC is taking the place of the anandamide, and the anandamide tells you when you have had enough food. Uh, since the THC is taking that, the place of the anandamide, uh, you're hungry. Uh, and the reason you're hungry is because you don't have the anandamide to tell you that you are satiated. Heroin uh, affects all of the uh, kephalin and endorphin. Uh, it also in increases the dopamine level, makes you feel euphoric, uh, takes your pain away, um, and uh, that's why people do it. LSD affects acetylcholine, your dopamine, and serotonin, so it makes you feel good, makes you happy increases your serotonin level. Uh, the problem is that if you uh, take LSD, and so it takes about an hour for LSD to kick in, and um, uh, if something happens to you in that hour, something negative happens to you in that hour, then potentially you'll have an, a, a bad trip. Okay. Uh, you'll, uh, eventually, <laughs> initially you might, may have a bad trip. Uh, and, of, of course, that has to do with uh, your serotonin and your dopamine level. Uh, nicotine affects your epinephrine, your endorphin, and your uh, acetylcholine. Uh, cocaine and amphetamines, of course, you get a dopamine spike whenever you smoke, so it makes you feel good. Cocaine and amphetamines affect dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and acetylcholine. MDA and MDMA are both rape drugs, uh, ecstasy. Uh, they especially affect serotonin. Uh, they really increase your serotonin a lot, uh, so they make you feel good. They make you, yeah, they just makes you feel really positive. Dopamine makes you feel euphoric. Uh, epinephrine, of course, makes you excited, and norepinephrine makes you feel, gives you a feeling of well-being. So when people are taking ecstasy, you know, it's like. Uh, uh, how are you going to pick a fight with somebody taking ecstasy? Well, it's not going to work because they won't fight because they feel so good. Uh, PCP uh, affects your dopamine, your acetylcholine, and alpha endocyphosine. Okay, neurotransmitters attach themselves to receptor cells on the receiving entity, your muscles, your organs, or, or other neurons that are chemically structured to only accept that neurotransmitter. However, select receptor sites may have different functions for the same neurotransmitter. Uh, there are seven types of serotonin receptors, each of which has a slightly different function. Uh, dopamine has five receptor sites, and the brilliant people in science have decided that they will call them D1, D2, D3, D4, and D5. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the, it's the D2 receptor that has to do with most of your psychoactive substances. Uh, that is uh, uh, very uh, prevalent in your nucleus accumbens septi. Each neuron maintains and transmits only one type of neurotransmitter except for neurons that transmit epinephrine, which may also transmit uh, norepinephrine. And this is, of course, the reason that we got these two mixed up. Well, we didn't really get them mixed up. We thought that they, that they were the same ones because normally a neuron will only transmit one uh, type of receptor site uh, type of receptor, but uh, in the case of epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, it does both. A neuron may have receptor sites for any number of neurotransmitters. A neuron is stimulated when it receives enough neurotransmitter to create a chemical imbalance in the neuron that forces sodium and potassium gates to open. This is how neurons function. Uh, they get, uh, they're stimulated, uh, it causes, causes an imbalance, the imbalance will open up the sodium gates and the, you will get a surge of uh, sodium molecules going out. 
uh, as well as potassium molecules going out, some of them are going in, uh, and at the same time you're getting negative ions coming in, and that will cause an electrical charge. That stimulates the neuron, and it will activate all the way down to the axon, then it releases the neurotransmitter from the vesicles, and it stimulates whatever is next. The increase of positively charged sodium and potassium ions from outside the neuron and flooding out of the negatively charged chloride ions causes an electrical chain reaction, yada, 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 yada. At the axon terminal, the electrical stimulation causes the vesicles to release. Okay, we already talked about that. Excitatory neurotransmitters uh, work by opening sodium gates, allowing sodium into the neuron. Inhibitory neurotransmitters work by opening chloride gates, making the neuron more negative and thus more difficult to stimulate. Uh, the stimulation of the neuron by the neurotransmitter is known as first messenger. So if it has to do with the neurotransmitter uh, affecting the neuron, it is first messenger. Uh, if it is an outside chemical, something, something biological or something uh, on the outside, it's a second messenger system. And this becomes important when we're talk talking about pharmaceuticals. Because when we're talking about pharmaceuticals, how in the world do they make the neuron fire? Well, the answer is usually it's a second messenger system. Uh, that is uh, forcing that uh, uh, neuron to fire. The neurotransmitter can't remain in the synaptic cleft or the reaction won't stop, so it must be removed. There's two ways to do this. You can either use an uh, enzyme uh, that breaks down the chemical, the neurotransmitter, in the synaptic cleft. A good example of this would be acetylcholine. Uh, acetylcholine, of course, allows us to move our muscles. How do we know when to stop? Uh, do we just keep going because uh, we have all that acetylcholine in our synaptic cleft? The answer is no, of course we don't keep going uh, because we will shoot uh, uh, acetylcholine esterase, uh, which is an enzyme, into the synaptic cleft and it will break down all of that acetylcholine. Now I can stop. Okay, now I feel better. That's one way to, to get rid of the, uh, the neurotransmitter. The other way is for the, uh, the distributing cell, uh, the axon, the, uh, to take back the, uh, the uh, uh, neurotransmitter. And this is the way it works with serotonin. Serotonin is, is taken back up into the, uh, into the neuron, and this is known as reuptake. That's why we talk about selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They are selective because they only work on serotonin. They do work on serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake. They, take, they uh, block the reuptake. I'm sorry. Uh, so it's reuptake, and they inhibit uh, the reuptake of, of serotonin. Uh, so they allow more serotonin in, in the synaptic cleft. And that's the way it works. Those are the two ways to do it. You either re break it down chemically, or you take back up into the neuron. The number of receptor sites is not constant. When the, number of, when the amount of neurotransmitter, this has to do with drugs. And this is one of the reasons why drugs are, are uh, so diff difficult to deal with. Um, uh, if I drink a beer and I get drunk, <clears throat> uh, tomorrow if I drink that same beer, I probably won't get as drunk. And then I drink a beer every night and now all of a sudden it's not affecting me at all. And the reason is, because when I drink that beer, it overstimulates some of my neurons. Uh, it overstimulates my serotonin and GABA neurons. And since it's overstimulating them, uh, they're, go they're going to try to protect themselves. One of the, the cool things about the human body is that it tries to stay in, at a point of balance. Uh, it tries to maintain homeostasis. The brain will try to protect itself. And the way the brain is trying to protect itself from this crazy toxin that I'm taking in every day uh, is that it will, uh, it will uh, reduce the number of receptor sites. It will down-regulate the number of receptor sites. It's the only way it can protect itself because it doesn't want to get overstimulated. That first day I got a pretty good buzz. The second day I didn't get nearly as much of a buzz because it's down-regulating. Uh, if it's seeking something, uh, if, if it, um, uh, we're, we're looking for stimulation and we haven't had that stimulation in an extended length of time, uh, what will happen is the receptor sites will, it'll increase the number of receptor sites looking for that substance and that's known as upregulation. So you become more sensitive to something, you become more sensitive to a substance. 
what happens when you take crystal meth, when you take uh, cocaine, uh, the first time you take it, you get a really heavy buzz. Uh, you're looking for the same buzz the second time, and you can't get it. You can't get it because you've down the uh, receptor sites have downregulated. They're trying to protect itself from that toxic overstimulation. They don't want to die, so they they downregulate. They there are fewer receptor sites. Uh, so that second day, uh, you have fewer receptor sites, so you're going to have to take more of the substance in order to feel the same high. And of course, now you're building up a tolerance. Uh, if you use something uh, for an extended length of time, uh, if you drink for 30 years, one of the things that will happen is the downregulation becomes permanent. And now, now you can't get happy. Uh, it's, you've, you've permanently downregulated your, your uh, serotonin receptor sites. Uh, you may feel uh, anxious all the time because your GABA level. Uh, you can't increase your GABA BA level because you've overstimulated uh, those neurons. Uh, so we, we've got a really serious problem here with, uh, with this downregulation stuff. Uh, if you've ever been around somebody that was an alcoholic for an extended length of time and then they stopped and now they, they went cold turkey, they don't drink anymore, uh, they're a recovering alcoholic. Um, one of the, the interesting aspects uh, of the, their personality is that sometimes they just get grouchy. Well, one of the reasons they're grouchy is because they downregulated their, their receptor sites. So they can't get as happy as, as other people get because they have permanently uh, downregulated their receptor sites. Uh, so, and this is known as a dry drunk, uh, an individual that is grouchy just because they used to be an alcoholic and now they're not anymore. Uh, act, uh, psychoactive drugs uh, work uh, because they act as either agonists or antagonists. Agonists either mimic or facilitate the effects of a neurotransmitter. Uh, nicotine uh, is an agonist for, for uh, acetylcholine. Uh, ethanol is a, uh, an agonist for GABA. Uh, LSD is an agonist for serotonin. And THC is an ag agonist for uh, the can cannabinoids or anandamide uh, receptor sites. Uh, if this happens partially, it is known as a partial agonist. Uh, if it mimics it just a little bit, uh, not, as, not completely, uh, if it's not, well, anyway. Uh, okay, antagonists uh, block neurotransmitters. Uh, if the receptor is stabilized, uh, making it inactive uh, by a drug, the uh, drug is referred to as an inverse agonist. An antagonist will block it completely. We don't see a lot of, well, that's what Narcan is. Narcan is a, an antagonist for, uh, uh, for almost all of your psychoactive substances. So we can give somebody Narcan and they can't get high. It blocks the uh, uh, dopamine receptor sites in that uh, in your re reward reinforcement pathway. Um, how drugs affect neurotransmitters? They can block the release of neurotransmitters. Heroin, of course, blocks the uh, release of substance P, and that's why you don't have any pain if you're taking heroin. You're feeling no pain. Uh, I've talked to heroin addicts. Uh, some of them claim that when they take heroin, it feels like they've died. Uh, it, it gives them uh, relief. It, re uh, it gives them relief. It gives them a re release, and they feel like they've died, and that's why they take it. Uh, that doesn't sound like a euphoric effect to me. Uh, but uh, then again, I don't take heroin, so maybe I just don't know what I'm talking about. They can force the release of neurotransmitters, forcing more to be released than is released naturally. Cocaine forces the release of norepinephrine and dopamine. Ecstasy uh, forces the release of serotonin. And that's how they work. The drugs can prevent the reabsorption of the neurotransmitter. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors block the reuptake of serotonin, elevating the person's mood. Uh, the drug, uh, drugs can inhibit uh, an enzyme that helps synthesize the neurotransmitter. Blood pressure medicines will inhibit enzymes that allow the production uh, of uh, norepinephrine, uh, which would cause high blood pressure if allowed uh, to be released in the synaptic cleft. Uh, so it blocks norepinephrine. Uh, okay, so you're taking blood pressure medicine. What does it do? Well, it blocks norepinephrine. If it's blocking norepinephrine, uh, then you don't have as, as strong a feeling of well-being. You don't have as strong a feeling of, uh, of confidence uh, if you're taking that type of blood pressure medicine. 
lots of different types of blood pressure medicines. Uh, there is one that is a calcium channel blocker. Uh, there's a, a blood pressure medicine that is a, a beta blocker. You know, there's just a ton of different uh, types of blood pressure medicines. Uh, drugs can inhibit enzymes that break down neuro neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft, allowing the neurotransmitter to remain in the cleft. Uh, methamphetamine inhibits monoamine oxidase and cate catecholomethyltransferase, which break down the norepinephrine and epinephrine in the synaptic cleft. Uh, so it, it allows more epinephrine and norepinephrine into the synaptic cleft. So physically you're more active because of the epinephrine and you get, have this feeling of uh, confidence and well-being. Uh, so if you take methamphetamines, it makes you feel really good. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things that it, it can do is that it can make you uh, act psychotic. Uh, you know, all of both of these things are, are, are good in, in mo uh, moderation, but if you have an excess amount of norepinephrine or an excess amount of epinephrine, now you're running around the, the, uh, the building 15 times and not getting tired, and uh, you think you're on top of the world, ma. The drug can in interfere with the storage of the, neuro of the neurotransmitter. The drug can uh, do a combination of any of these interactions, of course, uh, depending on what the drug is. While some drugs have desired effects like making the individual resist fatigue or, or block pain, they can also be dangerous. Cocaine forces the release of norepinephrine and dopamine, which makes the individual not only stay up beyond normal exhaustion, but respond, respond in an overly excited and sometimes violent manner. So if somebody's snorting cocaine, it's a good idea to stay away from them. Uh, if you don't agree with them, they may attack you. Uh, and unfortunately, I've seen this happen. Um, uh, <laughs> We had a guy that came into the emergency room one time, and uh, he thought he was having a heart attack. Uh, so we laid him down and we put him on the heart monitor. Of course, his heart's racing like crazy because he's just snorted a, you know, a ton of of, uh, of cocaine. Uh, anyway, so we've got him on the the gurney and we're we're giving him an EKG, uh, and uh, the doctor starts to give him a shot of something. And he was afraid it was something that would be something that would bring him down. Uh, so he grabbed a hold of the doctor's arm and he started twisting his, or you know, bending his wrist. And we thought he was going to break the doctor's wrist. Of course, we called in security. I grabbed the guy by the arm, and I'll tell you what, he was smaller than I was, but he was strong. You know, and it was this interesting wrestling match. He's got a hold of the doctor's wrist, and I'm trying to pull him back uh, so that uh, that he won't break the doctor's wrist. Uh, it was really kind of an interesting situation. Uh, first they arrested him, they, they strapped him down to the gurney and the cops came and, and uh, we tested him for cocaine and it was of course positive. So now he's got all kinds of interesting problems and the whole time he's sitting there screaming. Of course, this would be the time when you know, the emergency room fills up with little kids and, and they hear the guy screaming in the back. So they start screaming out in the waiting room. It was just horrible. Uh, of course, it took us all night to straighten everything out. It was just a mess. Heroin blocks uh, pain and creates a euphoric sensation by attaching uh, to receptor sites in the reward reinforcement pathway. But unfortunately, it also attaches to the breathing center, depressing your respiration and potentially causing death. LSD acts as both a stimulatory neurotransmitter and alters the user's perception of external messages, mixing their perceptions so that they may hear images and see sounds. And this is known as synesthesia. Synesthesia is really kind of fascinating. If you've ever run into somebody who can smell uh, colors and they can uh, uh, see sounds, I mean, it's just bizarre. Um, I, uh, I bought a house from a lady who had synesthesia in uh, Mississippi. And she had painted her entire house pink because it tasted like strawberries. Well, really? You know, it's, it's a color. And you're seeing a color. Does that taste like something? You know, the walls here are this off-white color. Uh, that, it, it tastes like a vanilla to me, you know, that kind, of, that, that kind of thing. I'm not that interesting, I guess. Uh, she was certainly interesting. She even painted her son's bedroom pink, uh, which I thought was a little odd. Uh, but, of course, we had to go through the house and paint everything a different color. Uh, pink bed, she, they had a pink uh, bathtub. Uh, everything was pink. <laughs> it was just so bizarre. I don't know, I can't imagine how, the, uh, how they functioned in that house. Other psychedelics block the action of acetylcholine, creating hallucinations, of course. And when you take LSD, uh, that is what you have. You have, uh, you have hallucinations. 
because you're getting all this crossover uh, from the neurotransmitters in your, uh, uh, in your brain. Uh, the body may deal with drugs in several different ways. You may develop uh, a tolerance, uh, tissue dependence, psycho... Uh, well, why don't we stop right here? Let's stop right here, and we'll pick this up next time, right here.